Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Coming to the Table. In this episode, it's going to be very exciting and interesting because we're going to talk to a head of a specialist team in negotiation. Um, we've talked about previously whether we're going to see a chief negotiation officer, and uh, this is not a chief negotiation officer, but it is a head of a specialist team in a very known international organization. Hi, John. Thanks a million because you want to spend a little bit of time with me and uh, welcome to our thing here. Um, John, could you give you a little, a little background about yourself? Sure. And thank you so much for having me, Kel. It's a delight to be here. Uh, I am currently the head of the lead negotiation team uh, at EY for the Americas. So I have 11 full-time negotiators underneath me and actually soon to be 12. We just extended an offer to somebody to, to join the team. So we are growing. Uh, my background, I started out with uh, actually as a newspaper reporter many years ago and then uh, eventually ended up at uh, IBM negotiating large outsourcing deals and basically for the last 30 years have just been negotiating deals uh, first as a lawyer and then evolved onto the sales side uh, became part of a negotiation team at Accenture uh, about 16 years ago and did that with them uh, until 2014 and came over here to EY to help build out a big deal team here. So I'm part of a team of about 80 people here at EY that just focus on doing the best deals that we can for EY. I think that is exciting. Thank you so much once again, John, for doing it. Um, John. Um, I think it's 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 very interesting that we find organizations that have specialized negotiation team. And the reason I find that of interest is obviously I'm working with clients around the world um, and most of them don't have a specialized team. Um, a lot of them, thank God, are very good negotiators. But I do also find some organizations that have rather poor, uh, poor negotiators, but they still choose to send them out and and, and make million dollar deals. Um, why is it, John, that some organizations have what I would call seen the light and, and actually focus on having kind of an elite force of negotiators? And why is it we have other professional organizations that are not doing that? Yeah, it, it's a good question, Keld, and it goes probably to the challenge people have with change and innovation. Mm -hmm. And they need right. to have a motivation to understand why the change is important. So if we look at the value of disciplined negotiations for business. And I just recently uh, got a survey from the Rain Group, uh, which is a sales uh, consulting firm that does a lot of these mm. terrific surveys. They looked at top performing companies and how much of their focus was on different aspects of the sales cycle. And the top mm. performing companies, over 70% focused on a disciplined negotiation process and found that that mm. helped them to sell value more and protect margin in the mm. long run. So you can make a very compelling economic case for having mm. disciplined, trained negotiators leading deal closings to avoid those you know, last mile situations that we've all been in when somebody says just before you're about to sign, hey, can I get a price discount? <laughs> mm. you you can keep keep that co that conversation will still happen but if you mm. have a disciplined negotiator at the table they know how to respond to that request if mm. you do not it's likely it's going to cost you some money before you get your signature on the page mm. Mm. so john you're heading this team of how many is it 11 12 people yeah it's a it's 11 people currently soon to be 12 yep Okay, so uh, how does a, a week look like for you being the head of that elite group of negotiators? So we do a, about a billion plus uh, of deals ourselves among, among my team. Uh, right. In some cases, we may run the entire deal from end to end mm -hmm. because if it's a smaller deal and folks don't know quite how to get started with a client, I mean, taking a step back, 
what I the way I always refer to them is we are a team of deal makers because mm. these are people who either have come out of procurement, legal, mm. or perhaps sales backgrounds that mm. know the entire deal cycle from initiating a conversation with a client to getting a signature on the page so they can run the run the full spectrum. And so very mm. often we get involved with teams who are doing smaller deals where they need that kind of coaching in terms of how do I get the client engaged? How do I put together a value proposition? How do I develop win themes right. and things like that? And they help to sell right. the deal and then carry it through all the way to signature. So a typical right. week for me is uh, checking in with my team and helping them out with some of the issues that they may be running to running into either internally or externally uh, to try mm. and get things resolved. Because obviously we have approval processes that we have to get through here. So sometimes it's managing. There's a lot of internal negotiation that has to go on to get a deal done in addition to the mm. external. So we're working right. through those processes but then also talking to them about strategies of what's happening on the deal. How did the client react? Who are you talking to? And, and so on. And then I usually have a couple of deals of my own that I'm working on uh, at the right. same time. So I've often got, in fact, I have a negotiation with a client right after, right after we finish this session. So I have things that I'm working on myself. So it's usually a, a pretty okay. busy week with a lot of negotiations and a lot of advice on negotiations. Right. Um, John, your team and yourself, are you proactive or reactive? What I mean by that question is, could, can, can you pick a negotiation yourself you want to participate in? Or are you kind of a support function for the organization? So, so your internal client will be calling you and say, hey, John, we need help. Yeah, we are, we are reactive in that people call us for help, uh, but we are specialized in different parts of the firm. So we have somebody mm. who only does tax deals, for example. We have somebody mm. who only does, we have three people who only do audit deals, for example. So mm. we do have focus that become a uh, focus on subject matter in some cases because right. the issues are the same. You know, they come up right. over and over. And, and EY is unique in the types of services that we offer, where basically we're aligned with the, uh, the other big four companies because we're doing audit, we're doing tax, we're doing regulatory reporting, which are not mm. the kinds of things you typically see other technology services companies doing, because those right. are areas that we specialize in and we're very comfortable with because we hire tax experts to do that stuff. Right. We have CPAs right. who do auditing work. Um, so right. it, it's important to get people aligned with subject matter expertise and negotiations because you get a lot of the same issues that come up in terms of issues of data security, privacy, you know, Graham Leach, Bliley and all those those kinds of things. Right. Now, um, John, it's my experience that back to what we previously talked about, that some organization obviously acknowledge the importance of negotiation skills. But what they tend to do is they they would take your internal client, the CPA in this case, and then try and educate that person instead of, of employing somebody like you guys. Um, back to my question before, when, when do you think our organization realized that educating the staff that is specialized in something else is not enough and it actually pays off having a specialized unit like you? I think every company is aware of it. Mm. The issue is how much they're willing to commit to solve the problem. Because right. you can you can often talk to an executive at any company and and ask them about what kind of negotiation experience have you had? What kind of training have you had? And many mm. companies will say we'll provide some kind of training. Here's an hour with these kinds of experts. They'll bring in a consultant for a day, a half a day or something like that. Right. And they get exposed to things. They'll they'll start mm. to say things to me like like oh, that's, that's all about anchoring or, oh, mm. that's, you know, and they'll throw out different terms about tactical things that come up in negotiation. And so it's good right. that they're educated on it, but right. what organizations don't do is they don't then take that training and say, okay, how are we going to make that training part of our DNA so mm. that if we're going to do things like say to people, when you get asked something by the client, mm. you need to find out what's behind the request what's the underlying interest and test the legitimacy of the ask and so i go back to that example of somebody saying at the last minute we need a 20 percent uh price decrease the response mm -hmm. to that is not 
gee, I can't do 20. Can you do 12? Mm -hmm. The response to that is, wow. Mm -hmm. All this time we've been talking about quality, accuracy, innovation, efficiency. Nobody ever said anything about price. Can you help mm -hmm. me understand where this request is coming from now? And what mm -hmm. that question is doing is it's it's testing the legitimacy of the ask from the client right. to say, right. is this something that things have changed or are you mm -hmm. just trying to see if you can get something at the last minute? And it's not right. unusual that it is trying to get something at the last minute. So right. does an hour of training to mm -hmm. a team of executives give them right. the skill to negotiate? What I well, the way I refer to it is you need to negotiate at the table. Mm. You need to train people that when somebody asks, you respond, not when they ask and you say, oh, that's a, that's a tough question. Let me go away and see what I can do about that. Mm. That response tells the other party, I'm going to get a concession. I just mm. chased them out of the room. They're going to go talk mm. to their leadership and they're going to say, what can we give them? They're asking for something. If I were mm. leadership and I were trained in negotiations, I'd say, what are you asking me for? Go back and ask them why. Did you ask them why? Go ask mm. them why. That's mm. where you want to get an organization to build that reflex into their DNA. Because what often right. happens is you start training people at the sales level, but you don't train mm. people at the leadership level. And then the leaderships don't know the lexicon. They don't understand right. the issues. And so right. you right. have a situation, for example, where you're an incumbent. And in, incumbency is a very, very powerful position to be in in, in business mm -hmm. because it, for a client to move an incumbent out is a very risky proposition. So they've got to do a right. risk assessment. And is it going to be worth, you know, worth it? So right. if somebody comes to a, a, a management and says, hey, uh, the client has asked for this, you know, what do we do? Well, if you've been in there doing this service for the last 10 years and the cost mm -hmm. of switching is prohibitively high, it's not likely right. the client is going anywhere. So leadership should be saying, well, if we say no, what are they going to do? Mm. Well, they probably will sign the deal anyway because they can't really go anywhere. OK, mm. then sign the deal. But if leadership yeah. isn't trained that way, they tend to say, oh, they're asking for something. We want to keep the business. Let's make a concession. Right. And that's the wrong right. move. And that's yeah, where exactly. the, the training the institutional in it, you get that mm. behavior up down your leadership that everybody understands this is the way negotiation works exactly yeah very good point john um john when you are recruiting uh people to your team what what is the typical background of one of those uh what what we could call a real professional negotiator it's typically what what we've seen uh is it's somebody who's coming out of procurement because obviously mm. procurement people are negotiating all the time. That That is the right. job. People coming right. out of sales because sales is another right. role of influence in negotiation. And then often mm. lawyers as well. Right. Transactional right. lawyers, because while they usually are handling what are referred to as the legal stuff, but we all know that the right. legal stuff is business stuff, um, right. but right. they specialize in, in the drafting. Uh, mm. they are often at the table as well. And that's where I started as well as negotiating okay. on the legal side of it and then migrating over to the business side and the sales side. Usually 15 to 20 years where they have been negotiating um, and, mm. and that is at the table. So right. what I am looking for is people who have the background that I can then help them with our program, learn how to what mm. I call run the room. Mm. A good, mm. which is why my blog is called running the room. Uh, mm. It's about the ability to walk into the room, assess the situation and say, okay, how am I going to get this deal to done? I'm a deal maker. Mm. What do I need to do to get it to signature? The first mm. step, obviously, is knowing your own team, because very often my people are going to be put into a conference room with a team of, of professionals who they've never met before, because mm -hmm. I'll say, hey, we've got to deal with such and such a client. Here's who you're going mm. to be working with. Call them up and get started. So it's yeah. a little bit like throwing someone in the jungle and saying, you've got one tool, you've got to get out of here alive. And that tool <laughs> is your experience. What's your experience? Yeah. And can you sell that experience and your capability right to do the deal to the internal team and then 
flip that over to the client side or the other party, whoever it's mm -hmm. going to be, and then also engage with them and build collaboration and trust with them. So right. there's, a, there's a little bit of secret sauce that's required for the negotiators we look at that they have to have a little bit of a, I'll call it a sales element to them. Right. That they right. are somebody right. who can be persuasive and influential and build relationship. Mm -hmm. We can't have mm -hmm. we can't have sharp elbows and hard edged people, particularly, you know, where I right. work, because we're trying to build relationships and collaboration. So sure. it's a very small set of people that that are doing this today. As you pointed out, right. there aren't a lot of companies that have dedicated negotiation teams. So finding the right people is is often very difficult. Right. Yeah, I could imagine. Um, John, could you talk me through? Um, I, I assume that when somebody calls you internally and asks for your help, um, is, there, is there any kind of, of education process? I mean, it must be tough for one of your uh, people just to step into a team and assist them in their negotiation, because obviously I assume they are still part of the negotiation team. You are you are helping them by being part of their team. Right. So do you spend time prior to negotiation? Um, uh, introducing them to what you are about to do so they are not in the way, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, so if if I get put onto a team to start, and it's a team internally that I'm not familiar with, the first yeah. thing that I have to do is win their trust. I have to win the first chair, right? The first mm. chair, as we all know, is a chair at the when we used to do conference rooms. It's mm. the chair at the center of the table. Mm. It's that's across from the chair at the center of the table on the other side. And these are the two parties that are going to try to drive the deal to done. So I have right, to earn right. that first chair. It's not going to be given right. to me. And the way I earn it is by coming in and sharing with a team of very experienced business people who have done deals, but perhaps right. not negotiated in the, in, with best practices in the past. I mm. know something you don't know. I know something about how we can get this deal done and optimize mm -hmm. the value for both parties if we mm -hmm. behave a little differently than what you've done in the past. So right. there's very much a kind of pinging that I do when, mm -hmm. when I come in and I start talking to everybody and getting a sense of, okay, who do I have here? Who am I working with? And, and what are the resources? And how do I have to influence? How do I get to done? Because let's face it, there's a tremendous amount of emotion we know in negotiation it's just emotion mm. in business. There's emotion everywhere. Mm. So mm. I have to be careful not to step on the ego of somebody who has been sure. in business for 25 years and has done yeah. a lot of deals right. and thinks right. they know how to negotiate, but perhaps yeah. they're making some fundamental mistakes because nobody ever told them anything differently. So yeah, that's kind of the first, the first step of it. And then it's really about understanding goals. So I've got to understand the goals of the team. What's the nature of the deal? Very often, what are the nature of the services? Because uh, EY has a lot of different services that are very complex and you know very high up, as I said, in the in terms of the importance to our clients and tax and regulatory reporting. So I don't have I don't have any notion that I'm going to understand the nature of the services. So I've got to ask mm. about that, and I've got right. to get educated and say, help me understand what it is we're doing here. And had you know, always ask, you know, how do we make money? Where does the money, how does the money go? Because that'll help you have, kind of backtrack into right. what the services right. are. Uh, so I've got to understand all of that stuff too. Um, and it really is just figuring out how to create that combination of competency and warmth that right. you can get that engagement with the team that you got a sense I know what I'm doing, you're comfortable with that. And I'm also going to be a good guy to work with, you know, let's get going. Right. Um, John, do you ever find, I, I, I could imagine sometimes there could be internal resistance towards get, getting an expert in because, you know, back to what you said, their emotions, that could be pride. You know, I know what I'm doing. It's my department. It's my client. So why on earth do they people think they can come and do things better than I, I am? So yeah. I, I, I'm just guessing sometimes there could be some kind of internal struggle, right? Oh, absolutely. There's, there's, there's very, very often a challenge in terms of how long is this going to take? Because mm. people, and and this is true at every uh, every organization I've worked with, and I've worked for you know publicly traded companies, privately held companies. Anytime there is a goal that somebody's trying to achieve, they're looking for the shortest distance between me and a signature. How yeah. can I get this done fast? 
Yeah. So mm-hmm. I've gotten involved with teams where they say, hey, glad to have you on here. We need to get this signed at the end of next week. Right. Rare, rarely will that ever happen. Uh, you know, kind mm-hmm. of assess all right, where are we at? What have we traded with mm-hmm. the client so far, et cetera? And then I've got mm-hmm. to reset expectations and say, let me share with you why it won't be the end of next week. Not because, no. but there's a process, right? There's a process mm-hmm. that has to be followed. And this, mm-hmm. and this goes to a very important point that, uh, that around negotiation that I explain to teams when I go in there, but I think a lot of people don't appreciate is you really mm-hmm. have three critical elements of a negotiation that have to be addressed mm-hmm. when you're putting together your plan. You have substance, right. you have process, right. you have emotion, right? Right. And people think about the substance, what's the nature of the deal and what are we going to do and so forth. And, and that's that's kind of a fundamental. You need to know that. Process mm. is so important mm. and mm. often not addressed by teams mm. who don't have the experience or understand why process is important. By, right. by going in too fast, by giving documents too early before they're fully cooked, you can destroy Mm -hmm. a sense of trust in a client of your competence if you don't follow a rigorous process to do things Mm -hmm. the right way, especially where clients are very experienced at this and they know how things are supposed to get done. And we're trying to short circuit it. I've had Mm -hmm. I've had people hand me PowerPoints and say, this is what we're going to ask the client to sign. Hmm. Well, you can't sign a PowerPoint as a as a contract. You know, hmm. I need a I need a term sheet. Can we sign a term sheet and get the work started? Hmm. No, it's a term sheet. It's not a contract. Hmm. So the process, hmm. if it's not managed well, will destroy right. the substance of the deal. You can take a great deal and mismanage right. it and blow it apart right. if it's not done right. right. And then there's right. the emotion, the whole trust building aspect, how you manage the process and the level of competence that hmm. you show is part right. of that trust building exercise with the client. And, and that's where you, you've got to be very careful about the emotion and how you're, you're triggering right. that sense with the client. Right. That makes sense. John, how are you guys introduced uh, in front of you, of, of the counterpart? Are you introduced as, 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 as a negotiation expert? Because I, I was thinking if you are, that could probably make the counterpart nervous, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a really great question. Uh, whenever I, whenever, I am introduced, I intro, or I introduce myself. I always say I'm part of the commercial team, which is right. true. I am part of the commercial team. Sure. I do sure. not try to say that I am a negotiator and I've been negotiating for 30 years, et cetera, because exactly to your point, Kel, it sets it sets off an antenna with the client of mm-hmm. uh oh, you know, who do we yeah. have here? Is this Jedi mind tricks? You know, what's going on yeah. here, et cetera. Now, sure. that being said, when I get involved in a deal, I try to find my counterpart on the other side. Mm. And I am hoping that I'm going to find a deeply experienced person with a lot mm. of negotiation background on the other side of right. the table. And, and right. I will try to build a relationship with, with them on the basis of the fact that you and I, Keld, are the only people in this conference room who know how to get deals done. This is mm. what we do for a living. So I don't need Mm. to say I am a negotiator as if that has some Mm. kind of special magical power. They do Mm. know I'm a deal maker. And Mm. and you, if you're somebody in sourcing, procurement or whatever, the business development, and you are a deal maker. And between the two of us, we know how this works. Let's manage the rest of these people. Mm. You know, and you sort of have fun with the fact that they all think they know how to do a deal, but we know how to Mm. do a deal. We're going to get this done. Mm. And I have I have built long term relationships with the people on the other side of the table throughout my career. In fact, it's very funny. Often when I would get phone calls, people would say, John, can you come in and help us because we need a tough negotiator? Mm -hmm. And my response, and we want to preserve the relationship too, right? Mm -hmm. And my response (laughs) is, I'm happy to help you, but I am not Mm -hmm. a tough negotiator. I'm a disciplined Mm -hmm. negotiator. And if I do my job right, at the end of this, we will have a better relationship with the client than mm-hmm. when we started. Mm-hmm. I do not expect mm-hmm. to leave broken glass behind me with my counterpart right. because we should okay. build collaboration and get the best deal out of this that we can. Sure. Um, John, um, the, the typical counterpart, you just mentioned it could be procurement. Is it uh, when, when you guys are selling your services, is it typical uh, 
a procurement specialist from the counterpart who's who's representing their negotiation team today? Or could it be somebody else? It can be a combination. Often it is somebody in uh, a procurement or uh, sourcing role, especially if it is technology. So mm. if we're doing something that is a pure technology play like systems integration or some kind of, uh, of um, other software development or something like that, building a platform, that typically you get somebody who's part of the technology consulting practice for procurement and sourcing. If we're right. doing something that's a little bit higher up in the fuse box, let's say it's mm. tax, where we are outsourcing a tax department uh, for a client, then mm. we might be actually negotiating with the vice president of tax uh, right. at the right. company. And because right. they are the economic buyer, they are the deal owner, and they know the right. issues. And it's not something that they would bring in somebody from sourcing and procurement right. to talk about how uh, how the tax department's going to be uh, right. uh, managed going forward. So yeah. in that, uh, in other instances, though, if it's some kind of a hybrid of that, uh, sometimes if we're doing a large transformation deal, there may be somebody who is brought in from their commercial organization, vendor relations or something like that, who's not necessarily right. a pure procurement person, but is kind right. of a business person that works with vendors, quasi business development, and then they get right. involved and they become my counterpart. And then they work with procurement in terms of what are the processes that we need to get through uh, in order to, you know, the docu sign and everything else to make sure we're checking the boxes uh, of requirements for the company. Right, um, John. In my experience, um, thank God I meet, as I said earlier, a lot of really good, qualified, great negotiators. But once in a while, uh, negotiating on behalf of a client, I sometimes meet counterparts who are really not competent in the science of negotiating. You know, they just don't know what we're doing or how to negotiate. And I often tell my students and clients, the worst part you can meet is actually, the worst counterpart you can meet is actually one who doesn't know how to negotiate because it makes yeah. things complicated for everybody. I, I truly enjoy meeting a professional counterpart and they may even be su superior to me in the science of negotiation. It just makes things better yes. when you are watching somebody that, that can do that thing. Um, my question to you, John, is that, I mean, you're doing so many negotiations. Do, do you find once in a while that you are sitting in front of somebody that have no clue on what negotiation is, should be, or could be? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and like you, I would rather negotiate with the most experienced person that they can find, even more experienced than me, uh, than with somebody who doesn't know how to negotiate. And the reason mm -hmm. for that is ignorance creates resistance mm -hmm. when you have somebody who does not know how negotiation works particularly in our business they don't mm -hmm. know when it's okay to say yes mm -hmm. because they don't mm -hmm. know what yes means so yeah. instead they will keep saying no to things because no is the mm -hmm. safest word that we have right no means nothing's mm -hmm. going to change i'm not taking any risk so they will mm -hmm. say no to things until somebody tells them to say yes. Mm -hmm. So right, right. sometimes, and, and that's, an, that's an assessment that, that one has to make with one's counterpart to say, what's the mm -hmm. level of commitment that mm -hmm. this person can make? What's their authority in this mm -hmm. negotiation? Because sometimes I end up facing off with somebody who their only authority is to ask for and accept a concession. Right. And I may be in a mode of, let's problem solve let's brainstorm yeah. i yeah. i see more value we can bring here we can expand the zopa there's so much more mm. we can do here and they don't have that authority or capacity maybe they have the ability but they just don't have the authority to be able to yeah. do it right and so that's the the and and i do run into those folks who either they lack that authority or again sometimes they lack the the experience uh right. and, and in fact i had i had this very recently with a, uh, a young young woman who was wonderful to work with and obviously had some experience, but the way that she was asking for things, mm. she, she was she was anchoring like out of this world on stuff, saying, "Well, this is what we want," and I would say, "Oh mm. my gosh, you are <laughs> you're just like that's not even in market. You're you're out in left field with that request. You got to bring that request back in again." And the problem with that is, you know, you end up with what I call the million dollar car scenario, 
right? Mm -hmm. Where somebody says, you say to somebody, I want to buy your car. And they say, okay, it's a million dollars. It's a million dollars. I'll give you $20,000 for the car. And they say, okay, um, 30,000. Now I came down $970,000. So what are you going to come up? No, you didn't come down. You're your opening bid was ridiculous. You just came right. to sanity here. And now we're right. having a negotiation. So sometimes <laughs> when you get somebody who doesn't have the experience of yeah. how is this played, what's appropriate, right. what's in market, they'll ask for things right. that are so out of market that then you've got, oh my gosh, now I gotta now I gotta have a conversation about how to drag this back in and get this back into mm-hmm. legitimacy. And that just right. becomes an effort. You know, it's just more right. work. Right, exactly. Um, one thing that I have learned throughout the years and I'm working on with my client as well is what I call trust currency. And I call it mm-hmm. trust currency because it's obviously trust. And what I claim is that trust is a monetary value in a, in a relationship. You know, if we have a high level of trust, we are actually reducing transactional cost and profit will go up. Um, is that something you and your team are focusing on as well, trying to establish trust or increase trust throughout your negotiation with the counterpart, John? Oh, ab- absolutely. The, 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 the value of trust in terms of the quality of the deals that you can get and, and the quality of the negotiation cannot be overstated. Mm. We try to build trusted relationships at the highest level that we can with our client because that's where we're serving. We're often serving mm. the CFO or somebody like that. So we want them to understand and appreciate the value mm. that we're bringing, want to mm. keep working with us. We solve complex problems, et cetera. Mm. And when you have that mm. level of trust, you mm. the whole issue about price becomes almost immaterial at that level. Yeah. And so yeah. you, you move away from the whole thing about how much is this going to cost me? Because instead, mm. when you have trust, you're focused on outcomes mm. instead. Right. Um, right. My, I have never seen a client pick the Mm. best service provider. A Mm. client will always pick the service provider most likely to succeed. So that may not be, you know, somebody who is viewed as the best in the business. It might be Mm. the service provider who is the best at this particular function and is going to get it done because they have the references and so forth. That decision is a trust based decision Mm. because the client is saying i am putting my trust in you by choosing you that you are going to be the one that's going to make me successful and the more that we can do as negotiators to help Mm -hmm. them help build that trust the easier Mm. the job is is between us right right exactly um john um another thing that i'm sometimes focused on is is how we perceive negotiation and what i'm often saying that you know you know united nation has never actually decided or declared a, a international standard for negotiation so so we see negotiation very differently you know you could have a counterpart coming to the table and and thinking negotiations like playing tennis and we might be sitting here thinking negotiations like playing ch- chess um, have you have you met a counterpart? And I'm always sure you have. So how did you feel about it when you had a counterpart that perceived negotiation very differently than than than, than you did? That must be something that you experienced as well, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I had I had one uh, many years ago. It was a, lo- a large outsourcing deal where we were going back and forth on different issues, and it was again a situation where they had asked for extreme positions on things, and we had to pull them back in. And at one point, my counterpart says, well, I've given on eight things and you've given on four. So <laughs> it's your turn. <laughs> I, I literally kind of went back like, that's how this works. Like we're, we're keeping <laughs> score here. So so it, it's it's trying to get that sense of collaboration. And, you know, negotiation is is no different than any other. A discipline that involves influence, right? I mean, it's no right. different than, like you mentioned, diplomacy with the United Nations. It's sales. Right. It's raising children is is all about influence. Courtship right. is all about influence. And mm-hmm. ultimately, these things are about conversations. And that's right. why I think a lot of people have a fear that there's a perception, you know, as you said, of what is a negotiation and people think it's confrontational. It's going to be a fight. Mm-hmm. First thing that, mm-hmm. that I recommend is, is get practice for people. Mm-hmm. Get practice. Mm-hmm. Do negotiate wherever you can. 
I'm, sure. I've negotiated with my uh, with the local pizza place, gone mm. in and you know asked for something. Can I get this with that? Not because mm. I wanted it, but because I wanted mm. to see how it felt to do that. Uh, sure. You know, in a store, wherever you just mm. ask for something, and not right. because you're trying to get it, but you want to see how it it feels. So you yeah. do that kind of practice, and it starts to feel comfortable mm. to you. And then when you're going in, you and if you can say to yourself. I really just need to have a conversation with this person about how right. we're going to achieve a common goal. Right. Now, I think it's important to say, though, that this also depends on what type of negotiation you're having. Mm. Because mm. if you're in a negotiation that does not involve a long term relationship, which mm. all of ours do, obviously, because we're sure. business and we're building a client base and we're doing sure. work for our clients. So we care deeply about the relationship. But sure. when people buy a house or buy a car mm. or something, mm. you don't mm. need to worry about relationship because mm. you're one and done and you're out. Right. So you're right. going to focus more on substance, less on relationship. If you're negotiating right. with your family, mm. you're going to focus more on relationship and less on substance. Because mm. if I'm trying to negotiate with my wife on where we're going on vacation, the outcome is that we're going on vacation together. Mm. I don't want to <laughs> win that negotiation yeah. and go on vacation sure. by myself and she goes somewhere else. <laughs> so my behavior changes in sure. business negotiations. And, and the other one, too, I, I would cite is, is hostage negotiations, because that's been a very mm. big thing lately, people talking about hostage negotiations. That's right. a much more a positional substance based mm -hmm. negotiation, less about yeah. relationship because right. hostage negotiators don't have ongoing mm -hmm. relationships with mm -hmm. the people who, you know, they resolve the situation with whoever has taken the hostages. They, those people go right. to jail or whatever happens to them and they're done. Sure. So sure. where we are in business is mm -hmm. we're up in the combination of substance and relationship. And that's the, the challenge that a lot of businesses have is they start to drift down into the relationship box, mm -hmm. thinking mm -hmm. that that's more important. And they give up, they accommodate on their substance. Then this is mm -hmm. where they suboptimize their outcome. So when right. you have, when a business has a team of people who understand how mm -hmm. to help you negotiate in a collaborative, positive way that builds trust and you bring in people who just do this all the time. You can right. stay higher up in that box with the substance and end up with right. better deals than drifting, drifting down and saying, let's make a concession for the relationship and start giving, right. you know, giving things away that you didn't need to because you didn't know a different way to do it. Right, right. Um, great advice, by the way, John. Um, John, do you find a lot of organization that has a, an official negotiation strategy? No, I... I would say no. I no. I don't think there are a lot of companies that have a negotiation strategy that is throughout the company. Um, mm. it, it really, it really would have to come from the top down. I mean, I, I don't even yeah. know that there, and and also function of measurement. I don't even mm. know that companies, as a discipline, say mm. to their people. Don't ever give something without getting something. Mm. I mean, that's a that's just a fundamental principle of mm. business yeah. and of negotiation yeah. is it's an exchange right. of value. There yeah. are many companies that give and don't mm. get. Oh, and yeah. that's not business. That's charity. Right. And so a lot of times they have built mm. that into their reflex and their DNA as yeah. a type of a behavior of this is how right. we do business. And again, right. They're leaving money on the table. They're literally mm. giving money away in many situations. Right. And right. so right. if a company, at least if you mm. can, if they build out a negotiation discipline with a dedicated mm. team and somebody who is saying to the organization, let me mm. help change the behavior here from the mm. top down. I need you, leadership, to back me up when mm. I say in a negotiation, we should walk away from this deal. Yeah. Because there are any number of ways that people will rationalize why we should do mm -hmm. a bad deal. And, sure. and, 
and this goes back to the, the concept of what does it mean to to have a successful negotiation? A successful mm. negotiation means mm. that you come to a good decision about whether or not to sign a deal. Mm. It's not about signing a deal because mm. there are a lot of deals that get signed as a result of a negotiation mm. that shouldn't yes. have been signed. Uh, no, deals absolutely. that companies regret. And yeah. that's a bad negotiation if your decision was mm -hmm. to go ahead and sign something that you, you shouldn't have signed. So sometimes sure. as a deal, and I've had them, deals we should walk away from, and I have said mm -hmm. we should not do this deal, and people right. rationalize it, and we go into it. And, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not the smartest guy in the world, but I've been watching the same movie mm -hmm. for 30 years, and I can tell you very often what's going to happen if we sign this deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, it's, it's very interesting you're saying that, John, and I agree very much because it's a discussion I do have as well. What is a successful negotiation? And when I ask a lot of my students and clients, a lot of them are saying, well, that is signing the deal. And I say, no, no, I, it's not a successful no. negotiation could actually be that you agree not to sign the deal. Uh, if right. that's better than signing the deal, then you have been doing a, a very successful negotiation as well. So that's that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, another question I have for you is that uh, McKinsey and Company uh, released a study recently, a research where they've been asking Fortune 500 CEOs in the US uh, about the chief negotiation officer. And uh, what they claim in their study was the majority, I think the number was above 90% of the CEOs in the US actually predicted that there would be a CNO represented in the organization within the next three years. Um, do you think that that study is correct? Do you think we're going to see that within three years, that that major organization will actually establish a chief negotiation officer and, and a kind of elite negotiation team? Perhaps not at that level. If there's more data that comes out about the economic benefit, then yes, mm. I would expect to see people, uh, uh, an uptick in the number of companies that do this. Uh, my experience has been negotiation is one of those things that you say to people, would you like to be a better negotiator or would you like the company to negotiate better? Or would you like margin to be better, et cetera? And they say, oh, sure. And it's like saying to somebody, would you like to be in better shape? I definitely mm. want to be in better shape. OK, here's what you got to do. All right. You're going to have to get up tomorrow and you're going to have to do this and work out. And people say, ah, that seems like a lot of effort. I think I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing right now. And that's what I think yeah. happens with a lot of companies is you've got people who right. have priorities and the executive right. suite is saying, how is this a priority for me with everything else I've got to do? And what mm. they don't appreciate is this can help you achieve your other priorities. Right. If you were brought in as the CEO of this company and your priority right. is that you need to increase revenue, you need to increase mm. profitability, et cetera, mm -hmm. by bringing in dedicated negotiators, you're mm. going to see that happen for you. And so mm. this is an investment that's absolutely worth making because mm. it's, going, it's going to have that ripple effect throughout the company. And here's the thing mm. that I, I think a lot of people miss is the value of a lot of business deals is lost after signature. Mm -hmm. It's what happens, particularly in, in our industry, in the services business, and I've, I've seen this for all of the major service companies that I've worked for. After mm. the deal gets signed, there's a lot of transformation of the deal. Mm. Who are the people who are, quote, negotiating those changes in the deal? If they are not skilled in how to deal with a client, that deal can, mm. can get away from the company very quickly. So it's mm. not just about the senior people understanding the, the process. Right. It's also the junior people who need to know. The right. folks who are on the line working with the client day in and day out. The client comes and says, can you mm. do this for me? Mm. And they say, right. yes. Or do they say, yes, and here's what the cost will be. The right. yes right. without the second part becomes very expensive for companies over time. Right. And so right. the, the negotiation acumen and discipline of the entire organization then becomes a revenue and profit generator for the firm. Sure. And that's where you see the return on investment. Yeah, very interesting. In, in the same McKinsey study, um, I believe that they actually reach a conclusion that the CEOs claim that by implementing uh, an elite negotiation team, they would improve earnings by at least 5%. Uh, 
And I was mm -hmm. thinking, wow, that is a lot of money if that's true. And, and so that's yeah. just back to what you're saying. If you can actually prove there's a and and in, in, in increased revenue, if there's an increased bottom line, you know, that obviously makes sense that that's the direction that, that you should go in. Yeah. Um, yeah, that brings me to, to, to one of my last questions, John, and that is, how do you see the future of people like you and people like your team? Do, do, do you see that it's, it's, it's peaked already, or do you see that's just a, a growing area? Have you already oh, answered no. that back, back to the question about yeah, the chief it, It's definitely a growing area because studies like you mentioned in McKinsey and, and the RAIN Group and so forth keep right. double-clicking on this notion of the importance of having uh, disciplined, collaborative negotiations and people who know how to do that and the value that they bring. So I think this is something that is going to continue to grow. I mean, I've, you know, I've been doing this, uh, you know, for a long time and the conversations around negotiation methodologies, et cetera, have just continued mm. to grow. It's something right. people talk more about. There's more books on right. it. People are more interested mm. in it. There's more psychology on it. So Mm. I think it is, it's nowhere near peaking yet. That's mm. for sure. Okay. Right. John, uh, thanks a million for participating. It's been wonderful having you on. If you should leave you. our audience with the one piece of advice in negotiation, and I know this is an unprepared question you're getting, but if, if you should leave them with one piece of advice, what, what would that one piece of advice be to a professional negotiator? Think about the people. Think okay. about the people, deeply about the people with whom you're going to negotiate, because ultimately decisions are made by the people and they're made mm. on the basis of emotion. Right. And in right. order to influence another party, you need to understand who it is you're negotiating with, what their interests are, what their motivations are, and shape the mm. conversation. Like we say, negotiation is a conversation. Shape your conversation of influence in such a way that you're going to shift their thinking from here to here. So that's the mm. first thing I always do is somebody says, we're going, I say, who's on the other side of the table? Mm. That's, mm. that's the most important preparation that you can have is know who it is you have to negotiate with. Mm. Great piece of advice, John. Thanks a million for joining me. I was so happy that you wanted to do it. Uh, Thank great, you, great Kelly. stuff, John. Um, if people want to connect with you and know more about what you do, can they get a hold of you somewhere? Sure. I'm on LinkedIn. Obviously, I have a, a blog running the room where I sort of ruminate on different issues of uh, negotiation and leadership. So right. uh, people are welcome to, to take a look at that as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. John. Take care. Thank you, Kelvin.